Hello and welcome to our webinar today. I'm going to briefly just go over a few little uh, things uh, to help us go through this webinar a little bit more smoothly. The first is that it does help to rem like keep your cell phones and things like that a little bit away from your computer, especially if you have speakers. Sometimes there's a little bit of a feedback. And also uh, closing any of your email or your Pandora or YouTube or anything like that, uh, closing those applications up too can uh, make the broadcast a little bit smoother on your end. And so um, during the presentation, you're going to be on mute. You can send questions to us through the chat window or the question window, and you can also, um, quote unquote, raise your hand if you would like to verbally ask a question, but we're going to be taking those questions at the end. So if you have any kind of question that requires more immediate attention, please use that question window. Um, and then if you are calling in over the phone and you do want to talk, uh, please remember to enter your unique audio pin so we can hear you. So those are the rules, if you will. And so without further ado, we are going to introduce our webinar, uh, What's Normal? The Value of the Developmental Lens in Working with Transition Age Youth with Mental Health Challenges. And this is going to be presented by uh, Dr. Jennifer Tanner for Pathways to Positive Futures. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Well, thank you. Thanks, everybody, for joining me today. And thanks to Dr. Gowan and the Pathways Transition Team for inviting me. Uh, thinking about the way the developmental theory informs the way we actually work with people, and particularly transition age youth, is very much the motivating factor behind my work. And so I really appreciate the time to get to talk about this today. In today's talk, we're going to explore what's normal during the transition to adulthood. And what is the value of using a developmental lens to understand transition age youth in the 21st century? And then last, to ask the question, can the developmental lens help us better understand transition age youth with serious mental health challenges? Uh, next slide, please. Great. And so to begin, can we just take a minute to reflect on our working assumptions about transition age youth? And I just want to ask, so what is the transition to adulthood like for this group? And so we're going to launch the poll now. We're going to launch a little poll because I'd like to ask you to reflect on the way you think about the transition years. For, for transition age youth with serious mental health challenges, is the transition to adulthood a period of concentrated vulnerability or a period of low vulnerability? So those are the two poll question or the two poll responses that we have. And we're just going to leave that poll open for a little bit um, so that you can respond. And okay, so I'll go on to the next slide. Concentrated vulnerability, 100%. So the quick poll results came back, concentrated vulnerability at 100%. And let's just hold on to this thought for a moment because we're going to come back to this, uh, the, the results here. Can I, can I get the next slide? The next slide? Great. Perfect. Thank you. So this is the cover of the New York Times Magazine article. It came out about two, it came out two years ago, and it was the most circulated of all the New York Times articles for months and months after it was published. Um, and the question that the article is addressing is, what is it about 20-somethings? So some say tomato and some say tomato, and some say transition age youth, and some say 20-somethings. And both reference people in their late teens and 20s uh, who are making the transition to adulthood. And people want to know, what is it about 20-somethings, and why do they seem so different from generations of the past? Why aren't they growing up is a question that we as developmentalists get asked a lot. Why aren't they creating families? Why aren't they settling down? Why aren't they buying houses and becoming adult the way their parents and their grandparents and all the generations who have come before them have done? And then the question is, what about for transition age youth, dealing with serious mental health challenges? What, what are the 20s about for this population? And so we turn back to our poll results, and 100% of our audience today said that 
the transition to adulthood was a period of concentrated vulnerability for transition age youth with serious mental health challenges. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to have a little bit of fun today, and I'm going to play the devil's advocate. I'm going to use my developmental lens, and I'm going to put forward some rather perhaps counterintuitive uh, suggestions and arguments so that we can think about the way, what is the value of thinking about human development and particular groups of people as they're going through the transition to adulthood. So just playing devil's advocate, what I'm going to argue today is this. I'm going to argue that we should not push people into adulthood and we should stall adulthood for these youth as long as possible. And I'm going to say that the advice that we should give them is to give them permission to ignore all the expectations of the parents and the grandparents and others who ask at every occasion, when are you going to settle down? And when are you going to grow up? And I'm going to also say, you know, as much as everyone um, will be shocked at this, I'm going to say I think that we should love Freud. We should embrace him. And remember that he emphasized the role of early child experiences and how those early experiences experiences play a role in our development. And I'll also remember that he suggested that the experiences of childhood root our adult experiences. Last, I'm going to argue, well, I'm also going to argue that mental health problems are normal, normative, and expected during this age period. That they're not abnormal, that they're not non-normative, and they're not unexpected. And then last, I'm going to argue that emerging adulthood is a stage of very low vulnerability and very high opportunity. And so with all of those fun, counterintuitive suggestions, I'm going to move forward to the next slide, please. And we'll return to these at the end of the talk. So isolating an age group, in this case the 20-somethings, and thinking about what distinguishes this group from others is primarily the domain of social scientists. And some social scientists focus on the influence that history has on shaping different generations. And when we're asking the question, what is it about 20-somethings, we're really talking about a group of people who are coming of age at the same time. And when we're talking about the transition age youth that we work with and we're thinking about how we can best help, we're really thinking about the millennials who are coming of age now, they're the ones who are entering our labor force now, and they're the ones who are using youth services now. They're the group that we refer to currently as transition age youth. And I like to use these movies to shape and talk about our understanding over time of the transition to adulthood. And so in the 1960s and 67, when the movie The Graduate was very popular, um, this was really an exploration First exploration in here, Dustin Hoffman is portrayed as one single individual who's struggling with this issue of how do I become adult? And he has this pathway to pick. And if you if we look for the common denominator and what is his life struggle that he's going through at this point, is do, do I follow the advice of people who have come before me and enter a stable job? and take a traditional route to marry someone that my parents expect me to marry and that society would be very happy if I married and get a stable job and get a home in the suburbs. Should I do that or should I follow my instincts to explore more and figure out who I really want to be? And so when, you, when this movie The Graduate became popular, this, this was portrayed as one man's struggle. By the time we get to the 80s, and St. Elmo's Fire is, um, was in the mid-80s, whole, whole uh, groups of young people were graduating from college and wondering, what am I going to do with my life? They weren't, despite the fact that they were enrolled in law school, they weren't sure that they wanted to be attorneys. Despite the fact that they had a journalism career, they weren't sure they wanted to be journalists. And so in Sanimal's Fire, this issue of two different choices, different pathways, different options, this started to be understood as perhaps the post-college phenomenon. By the time we get to the millennials and the young people that we're talking about now, by the turn of the 21st century, this issue of how do people make the transition to adulthood became 
really an issue of how do we understand now new and current contemporary generations of young people becoming adults. It's not just those who are in college, it's not just those people who come from very, very affluent families, but the group, but the population at large has, for, for a variety of factors, come to have different uh, transition markers, and the delay in becoming adult has become much more significant for entire cohorts of young people. And so the millennials, Generation Y, uh, next slide please. The differences between generations really had to do with the socialization experiences that you have during the formative years. So generations become different because of the experiences that they have in the early socialization periods of their lives. And primarily that's during the formative years, which developmentalists consider from the onset of puberty until people reach uh, adult, full adulthood and reproductive maturity. And so it's the formative years that we really believe across the field are really shaping these generational differences. And the, in the Generation Y, our millennials that we're interested in now and studying now, they happen to be the largest generation since the baby boomers. And why this matters is because the number of people in a birth cohort really shape the demand for resources. Right now we have a high demand and an increasing, the demand is going to increase, for services for young people ages 18 to 29. The Generation X that came before Generation Y, portrayed you know, with the St. Saint, the Saint Elmo's Fire movie, very small generations, very small groups of people. So if we recognize some needs during Generation, when Generation X was ages 18 to 29, we can look forward to needing a lot more of those resources as Generation Y continues to come of age. So some of the other influences that have shaped our Generation Y and our Millennials is that they have a very diverse background of care, family caregiving. They have high rates of experiences in daycare and early child care. They have high rates of um, being in after school programs, high rates of experiencing family divorce and single parenting. And this is compared to generations that have come, come before them. The Pew Research Center has studied the millennials and put out a very interesting report, if you're interested, a nice 2010 report. And they summarize the millennials as confident, connected, and open to change. There's no doubt about it that this is the wired generation. 75% of them have at least one profile on a social networking site. I, I expect that that's even a much higher number. And this is an interesting question that the Pew Research Foundation asked. Um, and the answer to it is 83% of them, of our millennials, have slept with a cell phone under their pillow. The millennials are not in a rush to make transitions to adulthood. So if we think about them as young people who are ages 18 to 29, 37% of them are unemployed, just 20% of them are married, and only 34% of them are parents. And can I have the next slide, please? Developmentalists also think of developmentalists also think of biology as an influence on the way people make the transition to adulthood. So it's both the environmental influences and also the biological influences that really structure the way we think about the life in stages. So it's this interaction really between I'm here. Um, here I try to visually show age as the green line going across, and the different structures that we see for graduation, first job, and marriage are the opportunities to realize goals that occur at different stages of the lifespan. This is because our environments and the cultures that we grow up in tell us when it's important to reach a goal. Graduation has a peak period of opportunity. Getting your first job, there's a peak period of opportunity. Marriage, having your first child, and so forth. The, the opportunities to realize your goals shape our lifespan because they set our social norms. And they dictate to individuals when a transition is optimal, when it's optimal to have a specific transition. 
society rewards people for making on-time transitions. Off-time transitions are not rewarded as much as on-time transitions. And in addition to that, individuals often have to go through a period of grief and loss as because they missed what we consider to be a developmental deadline. Uh, so next stage, please. And so here what this graph shows is the opportunity to get married. And so we expect that at different, for different generations and different cohorts, there will be different opportunity structures. And the marriage, the opportunity to get married is depicted here through age, is through age 30. It's when the peak timing of marriage is uh, currently. And that young people who approach the outside limits of the opportunity will begin to feel uncomfortable and as if they've missed what's considered to be a social norm. But researchers really vary with respect to their interpretations of the changes that we've seen in the timing of social roles. So the timing of social roles have been pushed back from the early 20s, now into the later 20s. So on average, young people, the half of the population who do get married by age 30, get married on average around age 25. And on average, first births are happening approximately two years later, around ages 27 for men, or 27 for women, and 29 for men. And the United States, people are often interested, is this a United, is this a phenomenon of the United States? This is not a phenomenon of the United States. In fact, just in, in to give a short, a brief description of where the United States stands, I would say that we're very much in the middle. The United States and Canada are pretty much in the middle of this trend to delay adulthood. The European countries, particularly France, Germany, and Italy, really are the outliers in terms of pushing marriage and first childbirth back. Young people tend to live at home until they get married in those countries at a higher rate than they do in the United States. Part of what drives um, the United States into the middle of the pack here is the cultural belief um, in independence. So our young people are being influenced both by our culture, which puts a lot of stress and importance on being in, seeking independence and pulling oneself up by their bootstrap, making something of yourself independent, independently of your family. That's really part of U.S. culture that influences us in the way we make the transition to adulthood. But at the same time, global trends are really ex extending and delaying adulthood. So again, there are two ways, I'm sorry, for, for the first time, there are two ways of really thinking about what this means for the transition to adulthood. In one respect, not meeting the developmental demands or not making transitions during the opportunity structure in, in which it's common in your society really has one way of seeing that is that young people in our recent cohorts are really failing to grow up. One interpretation is that missing developmental deadlines that cohorts have come before, that earlier generations have met, are new generations not meeting those developmental deadlines. One way to interpret that is that young people today are failing to grow up. And so in this respect, this has an important this adds importance to our understanding of transition age youth in general and transition age youth with serious mental health challenges also because what this says is that it's normative. This idea that the transition to adulthood and the way young people are doing um, this on average now, that the, that the majority of young people are failing to meet what we consider to be developmentally normal transitions suggests that for the entire population of 18 to 29 year olds, there's a very high risk of failure, there's a very high risk of vulnerability for the entire population of that age group. Uh, may I have the next slide, please? But there's an alternative way of thinking about what's happening and why the changes and why the delay in becoming adult. And one way is to think that 
um, in, in the year 2000, Dr. Jeffrey Arnett proposed that the delays in taking on adult roles is really evidence of a new stage of development. May I have the next slide, please? And from this perspective, what he said is that there's this lengthening of the transition to adulthood, and there's space now in between the time you leave adolescence and then the time you become a young adult. And in that space, may I have the next slide, please? Um, Arnett argues that there's a new stage of the lifespan, and he calls this developmental stage of the lifespan emerging adulthood. So he said that the years between ages 18 and 29, because there's been a delay in adulthood, what it has done is it has opened the door to have a new developmental stage in life. And he suggests that, that he calls this emerging adulthood because it's the in-between stage. And the reason why he says that it's the in-between stage is because when you ask young people, are you an adolescent, are you an adult, or are you somewhere in between? Young people between ages 18 and 29 are most likely to say, I'm somewhere in between. And by somewhere in between, they mean sometimes yes and sometimes no. In some situations, they feel very adult. So for instance, a young person who has been taking care of younger siblings for perhaps a decade by the time they reach 18 or 20, they may feel that they're very adult with respect to being able to caretake. Other young people have been working since they were 14 or 15, and then they feel like they're very adult in terms of their occupational development. Other young people feel very psychologically mature, but they don't necessarily have a job or a, a relationship that they would consider to be an adult relationship or an adult job. So in this way, when they say in between, it means that in some ways no, in some ways yes. They've completed some of the things that help them feel adult, but there are other things that they still don't feel adult about. Also, Arnett argued that emerging adulthood is a new stage of development for identity development. Identity is a developmental task that starts in adolescence. This Answering the question, who am I? What do I want to be in the world? How can I make something of myself? Where will I fit in in adult society? That question emerges in adolescence. But Arnett argues that you don't answer the question until emerging adulthood. And the reason why is because during emerging adulthood, the young person explores. So the dotted lines surrounding the emerging adult are supposed to visually represent the fact that the emerging adult is not ensconced in ecological contexts that, or environments and relationships that are permanent. In adolescence and then in young adulthood, there are more permanent roles and relationships that really ground a person. The emerging adult has a lot more flexibility in terms of roles and relationships. And the flexibility of moving in and out of relationships, perhaps changing courses of education and career, perhaps making changes in the way one lives, where one lives, in the lifestyle, in a, a, a person's lifestyle, style, how they spend their days. The flexibility of emerging adulthood really, from a developmental perspective, is in the service of identity development. That really allows young people to seek out new experiences that afford them the ability to grow and to figure out who they are. The instability of the age period is related. This is not emotional instability, although many young people do interpret the word instability to mean emotional instability, but what it does mean is there's just a lot of change. There's more change during this era of the lifespan than any other era of the lifespan. Young people are more likely to change relationships, intimate relationships. They're more likely to change where they live, their living situation in terms of roommates and with whom they live. Um, they move in and out of the parental home sometimes and other family members' homes. Um, uh, their work changes very often, and their friendship networks change often. So their lives, rather than being predictable, are really full of instability and change. However, in terms of the theory of emerging adulthood, the instability doesn't have a negative connotation to it. 
what it is is a just simply a descriptor. There's a lot of change happening during the period. During this period, emerging adults have an optimistic bias. They see the world as full of possibilities. They see their futures as having many different um, opportunities. So this is the, when um, Dr. Arnett did his research with young people. One thing that he often found out, which I'm sure is true for many of you who work with emerging adults, when you ask them to talk about their futures, although they have a very coherent story, a, a strong structure around why they're interested in doing what they want to do and what they plan to do with their lives, Subjectively, it very much makes sense to them. So from their own point of view, it makes a lot of sense to talk about how their world is full of these various possibilities. It's objectively, standing outside of them and listening to them, that we often understand that some of what they plan to do, some of the possibilities they see for themselves, might be incongruent with one another or that the young person is going to have to make a choice to either become, oftentimes you hear them say, I, I would love to be a landscaper, my uncle is a landscaper, I'd like to work with him, and I would also like to you know, own my own electronics store. And all these things really are, rep each of these things are representing a piece of the young person's emerging identity or the sense of who he or she wants to be. And we know as we grow older, we understand that you can't, um, you know, likely, very likely, do both of them, and that you're going to have to choose one path versus another. But in emerging adulthood, they exist. They coexist in the young person's mind, and that's very much adaptive, uh, a healthy strategy, we think. And we think that it has to do with um, the way young people understand their own sense of self and all their different possibilities that they could be. And last, emerging adulthood, compared to other, er other stages of the lifespan, is a period of self-focus. It's a time when young people really take to reflect on who they are. This is a time when young people are going deep. They're really going inside themselves. And again, this doesn't have a negative connotation. This isn't that the young person is self-centered, but they're not thinking about other people. They're very much thinking about themselves in relationship to other people. But the main work that they're doing is to look inside themselves and see who they are and reflect on the person they may want to become. Okay, so if this is a new stage of the life, and this is in debate, uh, this is probably the key argument in developmental science right now, whether or not the delay of adulthood Really, re really represents a failure of this generation and generations to come. It, does it represent a failure to grow up, or does it represent a, new, a need for a new stage in life? And so, from the perspective, from this perspective that Arnett has offered us, if there's a new stage in life, there's a new norm, and the norm is what describes the expectation at a population level. This isn't really to say that every young person goes through an expansive period of emerging adulthood. What it says is because there's a delay in adult roles, there's a new stage of development that presents an opportunity for development. Within that opportunity, there there's a lot of variation in who's, who is offered the opportunity. And there's very much a lot of variation in who benefits from the opportunity and how can one benefit from the opportunity. And also, there is the other side of it, which is that emerging adulthood might present an opportunity that stalls development. So for some people, in terms of the variation of how people experience emerging adulthood, emerging adulthood might not be as adaptive or have adaptive outcomes for everyone. The variation in what emerging adulthood means is what's of interest when we talk about our individual 
the individual lives that cross through the transition to adulthood. So when we're thinking about transition age youth, we have two questions. One is, how is how would this new normative stage of emerging adulthood, what does it mean for transition age youth? And also, how do young people go through it? Uh, if I could have the next slide, please. So one proposal is that as the child as the individual moves across the lifespan, they go through a period of recentering. That the child leaves childhood and enters adolescence and spends a period of adolescence in context in which the young person is a dependent. And the young person is receiving socialization experiences. The young person is becoming a person because they're shaped by their environment and the individual is acting on his or her environment. But it's very critical to recognize that for many of the experiences of um, childhood and adolescence, the power balance is structured so that socialization forces have a lot of influence on the development of the individual. The individual has much less power. They're, they don't have legal power oftentimes. They don't have power in the family structure sometimes. They don't have power in the community. They don't have power in the sense that they have access to jobs, so they don't have money, which allows them to influence with power. And so it's the power structure of childhood and adolescence that defines it, and also the dependency on systems of care. But at the transition to adulthood, things shift. And according to the concept of recentering, the change in the power structure and the transformation of the relationship between the young person and the environment is a critical juncture in the human lifespan. So if you're thinking about an individual moving through the lifespan, at no other time in the lifespan does the person for the very first time start to receive power to direct his or her own life. And we can think about this as a gradual process. It's a uh, compounded by gains of legal ability to guide one's own life, and families giving individuals more power to guide their lives, also communities expecting jobs, expecting um, people in intimate relationships, expecting you to take responsibility for your own life. Really, both directions are empowering or at least opening the opportunity for a young person to take more control over his or her life. Can I have the next slide, please? So the transition continues as the adolescent moves into emerging adulthood. The relationships that one has, um, and this is visualized by the state, by the solid lines around adolescence in contrast to the dotted lines of emerging adulthood. This, the second stage of recentering is the stage two is really emerging adulthood proper as the way Dr. Arnett proposed. In this respect, emerging adulthood proper is a period of time when a young person does not have, has the fewest or does not have ties to roles and responsibilities. And during this time, the young person only has temporary relationships. So it's not as if a young person's floating around, doesn't have any roles or relationships to speak of at all. However, there's an understanding, both by the emerging adult and others, that many of these relationships are temporary. This, is, this allows flexibility and adaptation for the individual to uh, experience, have different experiences, both with self and with others. Stage two is a stage of the recentering process that we're most interested in the variability of. Who spends time in emerging adulthood and who doesn't? Okay, so can I have the next slide, please? Stage three of the recentering process is a, trans, is a movement from emerging adulthood into young adulthood. Making the movement into a young adulthood, again, creates solid relationships or solid uh, ecological context around the young adult, which which represent more permanent relationships to roles and responsibilities. And as a young person moves and makes commitments to a career path or to a mortgage, let's say, or to a long-term lease or to 
parent a child or to be in a relationship with somebody through marriage or partnership, then when a young person starts making those roles and commitments, then those roles and responsibilities are what shape the life of the adult, the young adult, once they move on. So it changes the tempo rather than um, in contrast to emerging adulthood, but the emerging adult doesn't have roles and responsibilities that are telling that person what to do every day or setting expectations for that person's life. Young adulthood does. And so this is the difference. And so res the recentering process puts this idea about the transition to adulthood in a, in a process-oriented model, uh, approach. It gives us a way of thinking about what's the variation in how people become adult, and what does the variation mean? So if we think about a cultural norm being spending, the cultural norm now for our generations is spend more time before you enter adulthood. And the question becomes, who does spend more of that time becoming an adult? How does it affect their lives? Is it positive, is it negative? And what are the factors that influence healthy development during the, these years? Uh, may I have the next slide, please? And there we go. Okay, so also from a lifespan perspective, it's interesting to think about the biological changes that go on during emerging adulthood. So we just talked about what the environmental influences are like, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the changes in the person, what's happening between ages 18 and 29 that's different from what happens in other stages of the lifespan. Next slide, please. In terms of physical development, emerging adulthood is a period of peak physical health. Peak cardiovascular health, skeletal strength peaks, muscle mass peaks, speed and endurance peak, and then adult chronic disease is at its lowest. So beginning after emerging adulthood, around age 30, individuals are concerned with really maintaining the amount of health that they've gained through emerging adulthood. So again, emerging adulthood is a period of time when you're in peak physical health, disease risk is very, very low, and there's something very important about these years because what it's saying is, uh, Evolution, from an evolutionary perspective, where the body has a lot of strength because you're moving into your peak period of reproduction and also that you're robust so that you can, as you're reproducing, as you're starting your families, as you're setting up your new life, that you have strength and the physical ability to both care for kids and to provide for yourself for the very first time. Next slide, please. So we already touched on this a little bit, and that the reproductive system is fully capable by this point um, of the lifespan. And this is the peak period of fertility, so the period of time when you're most likely to conceive a child and bring that conception to live birth. And during the period, the beginning period of emerging adulthood, especially in the United States, the ages of 18 to 25, the goals of reproductive health are to, to control your fertility and your reproductive behaviors. So during emerging adulthood, controlling and managing your reproduction takes on peak concern, and um, managing the number of births one has in different cultures and the unwanted outcomes of sexual behavior is what is important about the reproductive system at this time more than any other more than during other stages of the lifespan. Uh, the next slide, please. In terms of behavior, this is a peak period for risk-taking. The um, individual's behaviors are still relatively under-controlled, com as in adolescence. However, the freedom and the ability to make choices for oneself increases exponentially. And so high-risk behaviors become very much the source of accidents and injuries and the leading causes of death for this age period. So it's not physical disease and it's not aging that's responsible for the uh, morbidity and mortality during this age period, but it's really 
behaviors of young people. It's a period where healthy habits decrease and a period where unhealthy habits tend to increase. So for instance, healthy eating and exercise tend to decrease during this period of time, but uh, smoking and drinking and uh, eating too many calories become more, more common during these years. The highest rates of death are due to accidents during these years. And then also what's important about behavior-driven outcomes is that when a young person engages in behaviors during emerging adulthood, um, behaviors that will harm them, lead to disability or death, the, the outcome of that is much more significant than it is, let's say, between the ages of 50 and 59. So becoming injured in a way that one is not able to work or function well in society between ages 18 to 29 has, will accumulate more disability adjusted life years than somebody who experiences the same accident at age 50. So the risk, the lifetime risk associated with unhealthy habits and behaviors is increased in emerging adulthood. Uh, next slide, please. Emotional development. During this period of time, young people are s gaining significant control over their emotions, yet the balance between positive and negative emotions is correspondent, meaning there's high levels of both positive and negative emotions during this stage. In later stages of adulthood, positive emotions are more common than negative emotions. There's a optimist, there's a positive bias that comes later in adulthood where the relativity of positive to negative interpretations increases. And so midlife and beyond, if there's the, if the same stimulus is given to a, an emerging adult, they will be able to recognize both a positive and a, a negative emotional valence to it. Whereas seeing the same stimulus, a midlife person is just more likely to recognize the positive valence and ignore the negative. So young people have these high levels of both type of emotions that they're working on balancing. Uh, one next slide, please. In terms of cognitive development, very recent, uh, very recent neuroscience has let us in on a little secret, which is that the brain continues to change into emerging adulthood. And what's happening with cognitive development during the emerging adult years is that young people are starting to be able to connect brain regions through the, free, the prefrontal cortex developing in a way that allows executive functions to become more mature. And executive functions are those that use two different regions of the brain to uh, create an outcome. So for instance, planning, organizing, and creating um, a plan for one's future are all part of the executive functions that tend to develop in emerging adulthood. Um, the next slide, please. What we know about personality development during uh, the emerging adult years is that personality changes more during emerging adulthood than it does in either adolescence or after age 30. So a lot of the change that's happening in their lives, the instability of their lives is certainly reflected in the way we see personality change. And by personality change, what we mean is that the rank ordering of your personality traits tends to shift. If there's going to be a shift, it's going to happen in emerging adulthood rather than later in um, adult development. I'm, I'm gonna try to get through this a little bit quickly so that we can get to the end. Um, the next slide, please. Social relationships. In terms of the social relationships, once young people leave adolescence, the relative value and importance and influence of family decreases, and the relative importance of peer relationships and peer influence increases, and also the impact of mentor experiences on young people increases during emerging adulthood. So i summarize what's happening. What we think is happening during this stage of the lifespan is that young people are starting to look for help in scaffolding their own development. And parents and families are involved in ways 
of um, in a relationship in which the young person was dependent or had less power for a while. And in addition to that, parents are not necessarily privy to the changes that are happening in society during the formative years. So their parents were socialized 20 years at least before them. And the real information that young people need is really more obtained from people who are either, who have access to the technology changes and the new things that are going on in life. So having a social network, a healthy social network at emerging adulthood is very important, as is the availability of people who can help young people gain knowledge about what the job market needs are and what healthy relationships look like in the 21st century it becomes much more important. And then last, but of course not least, in terms of mental health, and now we're talking about for the population of 18 to 29 year olds, while physical health is at its peak, the ages of between ages, I'm sorry, the stage between ages 18 and 29 is the highest risk period for mental health problems, serious psychiatric conditions, and also mild mental health issues. And in addition to that, um, we know that 75% of the young people who are going to have a mental health problem experience an onset before age 24 and 50% of them before age 18. So emerging adults who have psychiatric issues and mental health problems have a strong developmental history, a likelihood that there was a mental health problem before emerging adulthood, and that emerging adulthood itself may not be the trigger for the mental health problem itself. Uh, mental health problems are really considered the chronic diseases of youth. And so while the chronic illnesses of childhood and adolescence spill over into emerging adulthood, emerging adulthood itself is not necessary. There's some, not anything about emerging adulthood in particular that causes this peak period of risk. So if you think about the entire lifespan, the outcomes of the chronic illnesses of youth are continuing and spilling over into emerging adulthood. And at this time, the chronic illnesses of adulthood have an onset. And so the big picture of health, when you combine mental and physical health, is that mental health presents a risk for later physical health problems. So the mental health issues in emerging adulthood tie into physical health problems that will occur later in life. Okay, I'm going to skip forward a little bit. May I have the next slide, please? And so what happens when we really stop thinking about 18 to 29 year olds as a population, as a whole, and we just start thinking about transition age youth, a small part of them? And uh, next slide, please. This is about 6 to 7 percent of our population. I'm sorry, I'm going to try to skip ahead. Can I skip ahead? Another one, another one, another one. Okay, thank you. So now here the little blue dot in emerging adulthood represents our transition age youth with, who have serious mental health conditions. And we want to think about the models that we use to think about um, what is the specific risk and what is the specific vulnerability for this group. And so very recently we've thought about how development how the transition to adulthood might be a vulnerable period of time for this specific group. Okay, so they're at risk in emerging adulthood because of the ser serious mental health condition that they have. And the proposition is that the challenges of emerging adulthood are more difficult to meet. Well, it's really, if we take it from a lifespan developmental perspective, the challenges are more significant for those who have a serious mental health condition because both of what happened in their past 
also what's happening in emerging adulthood and also because of the difficulties they have transitioning into young adulthood. And so there's a value in thinking about it from a developmental perspective and that we can break it down into three different ideas, both of what is the risk that comes before emerging adulthood, what's the risk that occurs in emerging adulthood, and then what are the risks of stage three associated with emerging adults transitioning into young adulthood. The next slide, please. In addition to this, the other circles represent overlapping vulnerabilities. One overlapping with those who have serious mental health conditions is that those who come from vulnerable populations may add a layer of vulnerability to those emerging adults who have a serious mental health challenge. But the, but the stress is on may. They may have. Because for some young people who come from vulnerable populations, such as those who, those who have been involved in child services, the foster care system, even youth who've had a homeless experience, they may not, they may be at less risk than some other emerging adults who've never had the experience of recognizing, I need to know how to make connections with resources that because emerging adulthood the transitioning from emerging to young adulthood is about how one makes commitments how one makes connections with resources and how one figures out that they are they have a need and they have to fill that need for themselves there's a there's a potential for an adaptive strength to come out of that situation so the issue is are you or are you not more vulnerable? Do you have more risk or do you not have more risk? And then last, the, or the second area of risk for those who have the serious mental health concern is that they may have difficulty. They may or may not have difficulty uh, connecting with mental health resources. Many of them do. There certainly are age and stage related challenges associated with this period, but as individuals, the individuals, it's a question to ask rather than an assumption to make because some individuals have been in, involved in the mental health system for quite a while and they do have very good abilities to make connections and seek uh, resources that meet their needs. And so assessing rather than assuming what their risks are is an important thing that the, uh, a, an important value of the developmental model. Can I have the next slide please? Last, another strength of the developmental model that I think can add to our understanding of this special group is that the developmental model really tells us that we need to remember that the strengths and the skills that we're trying to teach emerging adults in our programs with our interventions, they have developmental histories to them. Identity and strengthening identity has a very strong uh, developmental history to it. Also, self-esteem, encouraging self-esteem. There's a, a Self-esteem is a lifespan construct. Skill development is a lifespan construct. And so understanding that it's important to assess the developmental foundations uh, is very important. So knowing not only what we need to target during the age period to help these young peer people, but what's their foundation like is another question. And then next slide, please. Last, the lifespan developmental perspective really helps us think about the fact that all these young people are going to take different pathways into adulthood. They're not all on a trajectory of continued risk and continued vulnerability. What happens in emerging adulthood offers us the opportunity to ask, where are you going with your life? And not make an assumption of linear change that the same issues that define and the same challenges that define adolescence may or may not define your emerging adult years, and then those issues may, may or may not define your young adult years. But every period of the lifespan is a chance for tra transformation, 
in a new period when you can gain strengths or grow. So last, I think we're going to return, if I can add my last slide, we're going to return to my, my working assumptions from the developmental lens and my argument and say that from a developmental lens, you can make a strong argument that the right thing to do with emerging adults is to really stall adulthood and to tell young people to not rush to take on adult roles and responsibilities. That if the norm for the population or what our social expectation is that young people spend a period of time now in between adolescence and adulthood, young people with serious mental health conditions are going to be um, giving young people who have those special needs access to the same type of developmental experiences, which is kind of a holding pattern before adulthood, creating a safety net and a good enough environment and a holding pattern and stalling off transitions into adulthood, may be the period of time where the may be the opportunity for these young people to get to dig deep consider problems that they've had in the past, work through them, do some identity exploration, and grow psychosocially. And the way that young people tend to do that is when they have fewer roles and responsibilities. In terms of jobs, I always tell people, they get caught up on, well, what if we can't tell people to stall out having a job and a career. And the way I break it down is to say, it's fine. Uh, what I focus on is, what your job is here is to uh, gain financial self-sufficiency. Rather than focusing on career or getting a job, I say the developmental task is gaining self-sufficiency for yourself. And one thing you need to do is gain uh, financial self-sufficiency. In this way, young people feel less pressure to find the perfect career, to find the perfect job path. We know that young people are going through approximately 11 jobs between ages 18 and 29. That can serve an adaptive um, experience for these young people. And so focusing on the process, which is gaining self-sufficiency, rather than the outcome that's associated with the young adulthood, may help and encourage young people to really take advantage of what emerging adulthood has to offer. Thinking about Freud encourages us to think that if we really do want young people to work on their identity, their self-esteem, their ability to build relationships, from a developmental perspective, it's very, very difficult not to understand both their foundation and what's happened in their developmental history in order to understand the work we have to do in emerging adulthood. Reducing stigma is part of helping young people during the transition to adulthood who do deal with mental health problems. In the population, mental health problems are normative, and they're normal, and they're expected. It's through prevention that we will be able to reduce the normativeness of this in emerging adulthood. And then last, emerging adulthood compared to other stages of adulthood is a period of low vulnerability and in fact, a period of high opportunity for change. And so compared to how difficult it might be to work on your challenges later, emerging adulthood is the time we might think that it's the perfect time to do it. So I'm sorry I ran late, and, um, but I'm here, so I'll answer any questions. Well, thanks, Dr. Tanner, very much. Um, I have one comment and then a question. Hopefully we can do quickly. So there was one comment from a young adult who says, as a transitioning young adult who just made the transition to another state to live independently with serious health issues, I think it is very important to remember that the delayed adulthood is sometimes the only option when it comes to services, resources, and eligibility. It is not as simple as it used to be for former generations, and as resources and jobs become slimmer, it is even more challenging. In order to really transition, the young person makes, it needs to make sure that all those supports are in place, which can be an ongoing struggle. So I just thought that was an interesting comment from, um, from one of the listeners today. And then a quick question is, um, Oh, sorry, I'm trying to get to it. Uh, do you have any information on the effects of the ethnic background in class on this process? 
We, we do. There are a number of people uh, working on this in the United States and uh, across the globe. Subculture matters very much when we're talking about how um, a stage is experienced by individuals going through the stage. So it depends on the environment in which you live. That's the way culture and um, ethnic diversity work on this. So the expectations that a community has for the timing of these transitions matters very much. All right. Well, it's 11. And so I'd like to thank, uh, again, uh, Dr. Tanner, as well as our funders for uh, Pathways to Positive Futures and all of you for listening in. This recording, as well as the slides, will be made available on the Pathways RTC website. So feel free to visit our website in a couple of days to access the slides and the presentation. And thank you very much, everybody. And we hope to uh, hear from you in the future. Bye-bye.